it's a car that's almost been forgotten um, and unrealized by many just how good this car is and it's only now that they're beginning to find out how good it is. It's a super little car, great little car. The GT Carrera and the GTS are two of the most um, evocative cars that you could, you could get, even today. What made them special? Um, the balance, the road holding, the idea of having the transaxle uh, with the gearbox in the back along with the differential and the engine in the front. If you turn up to an event in a Carrera GT or Carrera GTS, people stop and take notice. It's a remarkable car. The boost comes in at those revs, you know, like it does and whooshes away. It's, and it crackles and bangs and pops. It's a very exciting car to drive, actually. It is, it's the forgotten Porsche uh, and the forgotten supercar of, of 1980. Yeah, really it is. I was looking for something interesting to purchase and a friend of mine who's got one of these said you know these are good cars rare and hopefully the, the values will, will hold up and uh, I said oh, I rather like them it's a great car let's, let's have a look around managed to find one managed to find one uh, bought it uh, discovered it was a really nice car held the road wonderfully well probably better than a 911 which surprised me, and uh, then I went off to find find some information about them, and there was uh, not much. There was some books written about Porsche 924s, um, but they're generalisations usually. And as you know, most of my stuff is either rallying or racing biased, competition biased somewhere, and I couldn't find anything about what, how they've been used or, until I contacted Porsche in Stuttgart and found that there was a whole wealth of information there and they've got archives going back something like 30 years from when they did it. Some of them untouched for 30 years, these archives. It had to be done and they've been very, very helpful, um, the guys there at the archive division. Got hold of Norbert Singer for me, Jürgen Barth, and, and the rest is history as they say. And this is what this next book is about, the 924 Porsche Carrera. But only the Carreras, we're not going into the road cars too much, it's predominantly competition and, and the G, Carrera GT and GTS especially. And of course you know Derek Bell's got a Carrera GTS and he still swears by it today. He's kept it. It's one of his company cars that he had back in the, in the, in the 80s and he's kept it. And he says he wouldn't be without that. He reckons too that it's a, an incredible car. In so many ways for me it's special because it's the car, sister car to one I raced at Le Mans. They only made 25 of them or something like that. And so for me to drive this, you know, one of the cars that I drove at Le Mans, very similar, but, but they're more luxurious, because like that, they were GTRs, obviously, the ones who raced. I mean, doing that, was, it was just fantastic to drive, have the chance to drive, a, you know, a race car really on the road. It's only 10, 15 horsepower less than the race car. Probably the most famous and most important who has to be mentioned, and I'm sure he'll, he'll be happy that I have, uh, Norbert Singer, a lovely guy, absolutely on the game, and he's still as much a part of Porsche now as he was in the heyday. Multiple Le Mans winner, as we know, in terms of managing the team, and uh, a very serious guy. Jürgen Barth, uh, he needs no introduction either, um, still very active, um, tremendous driver, um, a character, Lots of stories, wonderful contacts. We also had um, at one of the interviews there a man by the name of Werner Hilberger. And Werner did all the work on the engines, especially the cars that came from the 1981 period onwards. But he'd been connected with the 924 project for a long time, and so he was very helpful. Walter Rawl for rallying. Um, I met him a few weeks ago, and um, he's a lovely guy and he gave me a, a very uh, interesting insight into the year 1981 when they used the 924 for the German Rally Championship. I spoke to Tony Droll, of course, um, he's in the book um, and has kindly done one of the introductions. Derek Bell, uh, it was a must because he has one of the cars and there's a little story attached to that. I went to see Derek to talk to him 
and uh, when we finished talking his car was parked outside and he knew that I'd got one and we'd been having a general discussion over a coffee. Uh, we went out to have a look at it and uh, I took a few photographs which we use in the book and he just tossed me the keys and said there you are, give it a try, see how it compares to yours. Amazing experience, a wonderful car. So I can vouch for the fact that his car is quite something. <laughs> part, of the, part of my contract with Porsche was to get a car a year. They, le they gave your car to a certain value. You couldn't have the money instead, but up to a certain value. And um, at that point, I said, you know, I'd like, I really was going to choose a 928S with all the mod cons on it. So I knew that by the end of the year, they'd, be, had, they'd had enough of me. They'd realize I wasn't that good, and I'd be asked to leave or not provide you to stay on, whichever year look at it. So uh, I opted for the new 928S, so that was like in September. And uh, we'd won that year and then the Jules car. And then following on from that, um, I was testing a Paul Ricard uh, in December. And I got a call from Professor Box and he said, I'm afraid we can't let you have your 928 that you want. You're going to have to uh, have a 924 Carrera GTS. I went, oh, bloody hell. You know, I really want the little, I don't want an Audi engine car. I want a real Porsche and the 928 SS is the car I wanted. So that seemed the way it was going to go. I was going to get this 924. So we go testing in January, the end of January, with the 956. And in the afternoon, this red 924 turns up. Well, I see a red car up on the balcony at the higher part of the track of Boring Car. And I went, oh, that looks cool. That, that's amazing, it's this beautiful red red Porsche with the white pearl wheels, you know, look, and now, you know, the, the magnesium as well, it looked absolutely fantastic. So I thought, oh right, and so as I get back out of the race car and walk back up, they say, hey Bell, this is your new car. And uh, I drove it back that, that night or the next night back to England, and it, it was just amazing, and it wasn't a 924 at all, it was totally, totally different. So that was my first sort of introduction. It has to be said that the, the guys at the Stuttgart Arch Archive Centre are absolutely superb. Uh, Jens Torner and his guys that work with him there, um, specifically looking after the racing side of things. Um, their archives are um, generally fantastic. Um, the amount of information that we would found on the 924 uh, was quite incredible. In fact, in the book there is uh, um, extracts, copies and transcripts of, of in-house meetings, decisions that were taken, um, lots of stuff from behind the scenes uh, that will never have been out in the open before. And some of these archives that we went through, there were 32 lever arch files of information on these cars. All the testing reports at Le Mans, all the records from Le Mans were all there, everything. And Norbert Singer at the time was sat alongside of me going through some of the stuff, telling stories about each of the little parts. So the archive department, brilliant. In 1980, they developed three cars. Um, one for, they decided for three, three countries, America, Germany and Britain. They weren't going for an outright victory because these cars were road cars that were a development model. And as Norbert Singer said many times, it was a development model uh, that they raced at Le Mans. Um, they had something like 375 horsepower available for that race and they started way down the field in something like 45th, 46th place, that's where they qualified. All three cars quite close together. Um, it rained, poured with rain uh, on the, uh, the 1980 Le Mans, right at the start, and within about two or three hours these Porsches had gone from uh, 45th place on the grid to something like 15th overall in the field because of the road holding. The race started in the rain and I remember after an hour we are in 13th place which is pretty remarkable, piddling rain. And, that, and it was just a fantastic race all the way through. We drove beautifully. At a, I, th I know at 8 o'clock on the Sunday morning Al Holbert and I were lying in 5th place overall. And uh, then of course a couple of hours later we had a problem with a piston blue and we had to run on three cylinders to finish the race. So that was it really. And of course I never I never drove the car again and uh, until of course I never, until of course I owned one. 
what what car would you drive around on the road now for a thousand or two thousand miles on three cylinders? You know, you wouldn't dream of it, let alone race it. So that was a major achievement. It's unique. It's the first time this story about the Carrera model, of which there are so few that exist, has been done. Um, it's the first time that it's that the actual model has been seen or will be seen by those even that own the cars over here or around the world. There are um, they are scattered throughout the world. Um, it covers all of the racing, almost every race. Not every one, I don't think. I may have missed some, but almost every race that the 924 ran in is covered. In America, when they ran in the IMSA and GT class, uh, um, GTM classes, they raced almost every weekend. And there's a tremendous amount of stuff and information in there. There's a full chart with all the races in there. All of the road-going chassis that we've been able to find, and we haven't been able to find them all, um, are listed by uh, country and by model number. And there's also identification of various models. But I think the main point about it is the number of um, interviews uh, with people that I was able to do, that we've, we've managed to have their comments about how the cast worked for them and their racing. I was talking this morning with JK and a gentleman who works in the, in the, in the market of selling and buying cars. And he, you know, we were saying just how that car is really coming on. And I know that for, for, um, uh, I was talking to an expert earlier in the year, which I mentioned this morning, but sat next to him, and he has a Porsche collection in North, North Carolina. And he said that, you know, he had, um, he had an offer for the one he owns for $250,000. So it's gone up a bit from when it was 15. But, you know, that's what's happening these days. You know, cars with a real pedigree, and particularly if they're like, you know, one over car, they, they're worth a lot of money. He's done 40, 40,000 kilometers, 45,000 kilometers, my car. I did a lot of miles in the first couple of years, but since then, you know, I've, um, I haven't driven it so much. On the road, the Carrera GT is still pretty much untouchable today in terms of road holding. They go well. Um, I'm fortunate enough to own one and I'm fortunate enough to driven quite a lot of 911s and it is the best road holding car of the lot.